We started with Hebrews 11.1, 1. faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you do not see. And so what I wanna do in our last time together is give you a way to see like God sees. And it's not gonna be perfect, and you're not gonna do it all the time, but I did write a book called When Changing Nothing Changes Everything, which is about four lenses that help you see a bigger view of what God is doing in your life. And I hope that this will provide for you some practical, actual tools for your eyes to be able to see more of what God is doing in your life. And I've loved hearing some of your stories. Some of you have been kind enough to come up and tell me a little bit about your lives. I know that every woman, would you just look to the woman at your left and right and realize that you're sitting next to heroes right now? People who are heroes. You are, you are all heroes. And so many people live these quiet lives that are just so powerful. And I wanna tell you something, ladies, the stage in heaven looks very different than the stage on earth. And there are some people that we're gonna find out about that is gonna be so encouraging and exciting to see. And God sees you, he sees you. And so let me help you through the psalm that we're gonna look at, this last psalm, Psalm 143. So um, if you have your iPhones, you're welcome to turn there, but we're just gonna walk through the psalm. And what I'm hoping is by locking into a psalm, you'll have that to return to and be able to remember some of the things that we talked about in this session to help you begin to actually be, live out some of what we've been talking about today. So Psalm 143, you can tell right away that David is probably not in a very good place. I believe that David was a four on the Enneagram, just like me, because he is just up and down and up and down, and you just see it in the Psalms. And he is so great for praying through the emotions that we feel, and certainly this is no exception. Psalm 143, here's how he begins. Verse one, and I, I've got the scripture up here if, if you don't have it yourselves. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. The enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in darkness like those long dead. So my spirit grows faint within me. My heart is dismayed. David is acknowledging the honesty of where he is, but he's framing that in the bigger view. He starts out by saying, in your faithfulness and righteousness, that is the bigger view around the smaller view that you have. And so that's the first lens I wanna offer you today. And it's what we talked about with Job, the big view. There are times in our life that we're so in it that we need to step back and recognize I am in a chapter of a much bigger story. Now, it feels like it's gonna go on forever. It feels like it's everything. I don't know why we feel that way when we're going through hard times, especially like, this is never gonna change. This is my life. It's always gonna be like this. And let me just tell you, ladies, now that I'm older, it is always going to change. It will change. And you're in a chapter of a much bigger story. Do you know that when I was going through my biggest heartbreak, when my engagement had just broken up, I had a speaking engagement like a week later. So I wasn't just the girl trying to get herself to church even though she was disappointed with God. I was the girl like people hired to bring in to tell everybody else why they should follow God while my life was falling apart. And I remember just going to God and saying, well, and as you know, by being with me today, I'm the kind of speaker that shares genuinely from what's really going on in my life. And I said, Lord, if I tell people what's going on in my life right now, they're gonna walk away from you. Well, if that's what it's like to follow God, no thanks. And I genuinely heard, maybe felt, I'm not quite sure what it's like when God speaks to you, but you know in your heart that God's spirit just said, don't you worry about me, little girl. 
I can take care of myself. I don't know what it is that causes us to feel like we need to defend God. Has anyone out there felt like that? Like, oh, I better not share that because then God's going to get a bad... You know what? We don't have to defend God. He's big enough to defend himself. And it was like I felt this challenge. Like, you think I don't know that you're in the middle of your story and that you're speaking right now? Why don't you take a risk and be honest? And so I did. And I began to tell my story. Now, this was before, as you know, there were a good four to five years before I got engaged. And I was speaking, and I would tell my story. And I remember the first time I did, and I was sharing about it, and I said, and then they got back together, and we broke up, and I looked up, and everyone was like, (laughs) it was like, oh, no. But then it was like God's Spirit just spoke to me. And I said, but you know what? God's not through with my story. I don't know what came over me to say that, but I did. I said, God's not through with my story. And I don't know what he's going to do, and I don't know if I'll ever get married, but I know one thing. I got up this morning, and I'm still breathing, so God's not through with my story. Some of you need to hear that right now. God's not through with your story if you got up. A lot of things may have ended, a lot of heartbreak may have happened, but if you're here, God has something for you. And you know what? I believe that that's a testimony. You know, sometimes we feel, not sometimes, I think a lot of times we feel like we have to wait until the rings on the finger, the happy ending comes, the baby comes, and now I'm pregnant, or whatever the story is, like, we have to wait till the end before we tell it, right? No! I developed at that time what I call the middle of the story theology. And I think that's what David models for us right here. That he was in the middle of the story. He knows God is faithful. He knows God is righteous, but life sucks right now. And he's not afraid to shout it out to the Lord. And that's okay, you're in the middle of the story. God doesn't want you to fake it, but he wants you to hold on. He wants you to hold on to him because he's not done. And so I think we need more people sharing in the middle of the story because I think that's where people live. That was when my testimony was the most powerful. When I was saying, you know what? I don't know what God's gonna do, but I'm choosing to hold on to him. I'm choosing to wait it out. That's a testimony. You know, when things are going great in your life and you tell people like, well, everything's so awesome and I'm following Jesus, well, good for you. But when things are not going great in your life and you say, and I'm still choosing to follow God, that's a testimony. That's when people are leaning in on your life to see if your faith is real. Because everybody wants to believe in the Santa Claus God. But he's not just the Santa Claus God, he's the living God. And he has plans for our life that are different than ours. And are we willing to say, okay, I wanna live. I'm gonna live the life you have. So the big view kind of helps you step back and say, I'm in a chapter of a much bigger story. Now, I know now, looking back, that I was. And that soon soon I was going to meet a guy that would cause me to want to kick that fiance right out the door. But I didn't know that at the time. We're trusting. And what's so beautiful and what I want to frame this whole talk in is even death is not the end of the story. That's how I end my book, Faith, Doubt, and God's Mysterious Timing, is with Hebrews 11, which paints a picture of our faith on an eternal timeline. Our time here isn't even the end of the story. So the big view says, okay, I know I'm in a chapter of a much bigger story, and God's faithfulness is going to carry me through. I don't know when, I don't know how, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm banking on God's faithfulness. That's the big view. The second lens is where David goes next. Verse five, I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. I spread out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land, the rear view. I know some of you know this, but I call him literally the God of the rear view mirror. Have you noticed that you hardly ever see what God is doing while you're living it? But when you look back, you go, oh, Oh my gosh, that's what he was doing. 
as you connect the dots. That's the rear view. And do you know that the Israelites had a practice in the Old Testament? If you look at the stories, you'll see that every time God met them, they would build what they call a stone altar, piles of stones. So when other Israelites would walk through those same places, they'd see the piles of stones and they knew God had been in that place. So I ask you, where are your piles of stones? What do they look like? Are they your journals? Are you writing them down? Are you singing? Are you drawing? Whatever it is that you do that God has given you to do, remember, remember, remember. I have a whole chapter on that. Remember. So many times that is written in the Bible. Why do you think God keeps saying that? Because we have amnesia. The Israelites had amnesia. You know, when they first saw an entire sea part, they could not believe it. They thought they were going to die. They were asking Moses why he brought them out there, and then the sea parted and they walked through. You'd think that a miracle like that would carry you for the rest of your life. So for three weeks they were, they were singing. Miriam wrote a song, you can read about it in the Exodus, and they're singing this song, but somewhere along the way they stopped singing that song. And then they got hungry and there was no food, and there was no water, and then they began complaining. And here's the funny thing about memory, is that it's not just remembering, it's what you remember. Because if you look at what the Israelites were remembering, they said, gosh, Moses, why did you bring us out here? This is a month and a half after watching the Red Sea part. Why did you bring us out here? If only we could go back to Egypt. Are you kidding me? If only we could go back to Egypt where we sat around and ate pots of meat. That is literally in the Bible. They skipped over the part that they were slaves. They were miserable. They were crying out to God. But no, now all of a sudden it was, oh, remember the good old days? Have you ever thought about that? The good old days that never happened. But suddenly they're so much better when they're in the past. You got to remember the right things. It's not just remembering, it's remembering the right things. That's the funny thing about our mind. So write it down. You know, we get, we beat up the Israelites like, oh gosh, I cannot believe they forgot a month and a half. Really? Six weeks? You watch a, I mean, if I saw a C part, I would never be the same. But just think about yourself on Sunday afternoon after church. In church, you've had this incredible experience and then you come home and you forget everything. And by Monday, it's gone. So it's not just the Israelites. We are forgetful people. That's why we have to write it down so we can go back and remind each other and be together. That's why we come to church. We don't come to church to check a box to be good people. We come to church because we need it. We have to remember who we are as believers, especially now. So remembering. So I have a funny story about remembering. And that is that I, in the middle of my brokenheartedness before my first engagement, so now I'm turning 40, and anybody who's single or has been single when they turn 40, that's a big one. And I was speaking to youth workers, and I was out in New Jersey, and I was talking about youth ministry. I wasn't even really talking about my life. And at lunchtime, they'd all go out and eat Subway sandwiches, and I would go to the pastor's office and just be quiet because I was talking all day long. And then, uh, so what happened was everybody went out and there was one woman who stayed behind. And I said, can I help you? And she said, you know, I just wanted to mind my own business, but the Lord wouldn't let me. (laughs) Now she had my attention. I felt like saying, well, I'll let you. Does that count? No, I didn't. I was like, wow, this is okay. So she came up to me. She didn't introduce herself, she didn't tell me her name, she just took my hand. And she says, the Lord is gonna bring you a husband. Now I'm just gonna pause here and say, I was actually working at a Presbyterian church at the time. And just so you know, we don't have prophecies in the Presbyterian church, we have meetings about prophecies and when they're supposed to take place. Like this wasn't part of my tradition. I had never had this happen to me. And she's naming the desire of my heart. 
So you can imagine how I felt. She said, the Lord is gonna bring you a husband. And I'll never forget her words. She said, he will love you as Christ loves the church. And he will take your head to his chest and he will protect you. And he will be a support to your ministry. By the time she was done, I had tears streaming down my face. She walked out, I never knew her name. I told some of my friends and they said, you claim it, sister, claim it. And I was like, I don't even know what to do with this. And about a year and a half later, when I met this guy, I was like, wow. And then when he proposed eight months later, I was like, I cannot believe this. And then a year after that, when we broke up, I wanted to call the lady from New Jersey. You know, there were a couple things that you left out of your prophecy. (laughs) But here's the crazy thing about God and why we have to hold on to him because the journey looks so crazy, is that the prophecy actually did come true. And anyone who knows my husband knows that he is incredibly every one of those words. But only after it didn't come true. And all the stuff in between is, the, is that the rain? Wow. <laughs> so God's coming down right now. And all this stuff in between, ladies, when it didn't come true and it did come true, is the most important part of your faith. Because that's when you're holding on in the confusion and that's when you're going to see God do amazing things. But it might look weird for a long time. And we're called to hold on. And that's why we need that rear view lens. That rear view lens helps us to live what we're supposed to live now. And that's where we're going to go next. And you guys are glad you're not outside right now. Verse 8. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. David begins, let the morning bring me your word. What's the first thing you look at in the morning? You know, I get in my, I I tell myself I'm going to look at the scriptures. That's what I'm going to do, or I'm going to pray when I get up. And then what happens? Your darn phone is sitting next to your bed. And the first thing you see, and do you notice that the first thing you see just sets the course? I love what David says. Let the morning bring me your word. That is where we should go first. But what David is talking about here is the present view lens, the morning. You know, no matter what's happening in your life, the morning comes and you get up and you have to live. And I love what he says. Oh, I I love what he says. He says, I put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go. For to you, I entrust my life. Teach me to do your will. You are my God. May your good spirit lead me. He's asking God to lead him step by step. The present view is where you live. And I've told you enough stories to know that God has a plan even if you're where you don't want to be. I thought it would be kind of fun for you. And now you can actually show the next uh, quote. Oh, do we have that picture back there? Did I give you that picture? Okay, wait. Yes, okay. So I want you to see this picture. This picture is what my husband looked like when I couldn't get out of bed after my broken engagement. This is what God was looking at right there. And I just love looking at this photo because I just think it is such a symbol of what God sees that we don't see while you're living the day to day and you don't know what God has ahead. I'm telling you something, if he'd given me a glimpse because my husband did some modeling in those days. If he had just given me a glimpse, I would have kicked that guy out of my apartment so much sooner than when we broke up. But we don't see what God has for us. And it's so much bigger and richer and fuller and filled with so many things that we have no idea what's ahead. And I had no idea what was ahead for me. But in the meantime, you have to live. 
Show me the way I should go. Teach me your will. Show me what I'm supposed to be doing because you are my God. And then the last lens that I'm going to lead you with is the higher view lens. And this is where David ends up, Psalm 143.11. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. In your unfailing love, silence my enemies, destroy my foes. Let's say this together, ladies, for I am your servant. Isn't that interesting? So David ends his prayer by saying, you are my God. I'm not telling you what to do. You're telling me what to do. I am your servant. Wow. (laughs) There is so much about our lives that we did not get to choose. And so much about the season you're in that you didn't get to choose. But there are choices that we make every day of how to live those seasons, how to live by faith when we don't understand what God is doing. And I want to introduce you to someone now who's a friend of mine. And he inspired my book, When Changing Nothing Changes Everything, because I could not believe the way he lived. He's my friend Chris, and he has cerebral palsy. And watching him come to church every single Sunday and eventually getting to know him and what it took for him to make it through the day, let alone get himself around, let alone what he's done with his life, was so inspiring for me. It was another one of those instances of getting outside of myself and watching someone and letting them change me just by watching them. And I want him to change you too. So I asked him if we could do a video together. And Chris shares a little bit of his story. And there's subtitles below because you're probably not going to be able to understand. I understand him now because I've talked to him so much. But I wanted you to make sure that you got his words. And I hope and pray that this is an inspiration for you as you leave today. So we'll pray afterwards, but let's watch. I am cerebral palsy. My outdoor score was zero. That means I was suddenly dead when I was born. I weighed three pounds, one ounce. And my mom had a cranial aneurysm and and she died from that. And then my dad took me home. He couldn't take care of me for obvious reasons and sent me down to live with my grandparents. I lived with them for about 20 years until I moved out. My aunt took me to church for the first, for the first time. We were, when, when I thought of church, I thought of choir music. And, and, you know, when I got there, it was a small rock band. And I was like, yeah, I can deal with this. So one thing led to another. I met Christ, and it changed me. God has given me new eyes even though I have a disability. And what I'm able to do with my abilities. Because of the opportunities God has laid out in front of me, I've been able to DJ. I've been able to do public speaking. I, I just landed a job at a new science museum. I've done several half marathons, one for the school for people with disabilities in, in Nicaragua. Jesus says, in their weakness, they are made strong. 
if I encounter a step that I can't go over, do I get frustrated? You bet that. If I didn't have help, I couldn't do what I do. It's because of God's blessing that I'm able to do that. You said that all these things are, are just temporary. Things are, that are unseen are eternal. And he said, when we die, we don't die, we just change form. That's what I'm really looking forward to. Because what I can't do now, I will be able to do it then and forever. Do we frame our life that way? I so love the way Chris lives. I have to tell you that when he went to Nicaragua on that mission trip, the whole team of guys that went with him, their whole mission was just taking care of Chris. That's all they could do. But Chris went down there to Nicaragua and he was able to speak to the disabled people who barely left their homes. And when they saw that he had made it all the way from the United States to be there to talk to them, they had new hope for their lives. Every life has purpose and your life has a purpose and there was so much about your life you didn't get to choose. Just like me. If I had been given the choice, I would have said, Lord, I'd like to be married, young enough to have children. I desired that in my life. That wasn't God's story for me. Many of you, if not all of you, are not living exactly the story that you had in mind but you get to live your story. And the reason I showed you Chris is if he can live like that, can we have the courage to take the stuff that we've been given and live it? Especially knowing that we're going one day to be with the God who's created this rain that's coming down on us right now, who is going to be with us forever and ever and ever. This life is only this much of the story. It seems so long. It seems like forever. God, what are you doing? But I'm telling you, as I get older, I'm looking back and I'm like, wow, it's passing like a flash. And that's what happens. And soon we'll be gone and we'll be in his arms. And so you didn't get to choose the color of your skin. You didn't get to choose the parents you have. You didn't get to choose where you were born, the economic placement of where you were born. You didn't get to choose a lot about your life, but you get to choose every day how you live with those things. And so my encouragement to you ladies and for myself is to just keep living our days that God has given us here so that at the end, God is gonna say, well done, good and faithful servant. And when I get to the end of my life, God's not gonna to say to me, Lori, why weren't you Moses? But what a tragedy if he said, Lori, why weren't you Lori? We have to fight to be ourselves in this culture. We look at social media and we want everybody else's life. God wants you to live your life because he's written you into his story. And he loves you like crazy and he's with you. He's with you. And even if you came here and you weren't sure about what you felt about God and what you believed about God, you can know this God. This God can be with you. And for those of you who've been walking with him but you feel distant from him, he is with you even if you don't feel it. And I pray if nothing else, you leave this place with more courage to live the life that he has given you to live. So let me pray for you, and then I'll have Connie come up and give us our clothes. I'm going to ask if you want, and this is completely optional, but to maybe take the hand of the woman on your left and right, or just as a, a chance for us to be together. One last time we've shared in this moment together, this day. 
And maybe take a moment in the silence and just pray for the person that's next to you on either side. And it's okay if you don't know everything that's going on for them, but just pray for them because God knows. Lord, I thank you that we're not called to do this life alone, that you've given us people to walk with, that this church wants to be a place where people can come and find other people to help and to walk with them. I pray no one leaves here today without that knowledge that there are people who care and want to be with them. But most of all, I pray for my sisters and myself, Lord, that we would continue to live our days I know I've sometimes gotten to the place where I'm like, am I still doing this? I'm so old. And you just say, keep living, keep living, keep doing the thing that God has given you to do. And you don't know who you're touching. You don't know what God is going to do with what you do. You don't know who will be touched by the people that you are touching. And that's your story, Lord, and I just pray that we have the courage to live these lives, and I thank you for being our God who doesn't leave us to do it alone. You are God with us, Emmanuel, and you showed us that in Jesus, and we thank you so much for his life, for his death, for his conquering death, for what he shows us about our own lives and the relationship that we can have with you. And God, we just know we can do it, no matter what it is that we face going out this door, because we have you. And so we thank you, we praise you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.